Well, hello there. Welcome to Totally Possum. It's Melissa here again. Oh, don't, don't hang up. Don't, don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. We are actually going to have an episode for you right now. But our that episode was cursed. It took us a little longer to get it together, re-recorded, edited. It takes quite a bit of time. So at the head, I just want to tell you what you're getting into today. On today's episode, we're going to be doing a magical, spectacular giveaway or something. We are going to be talking about COVID-19 dogs and the things that maybe you haven't really thought about while they're going into schools and buildings and sporting events. Basically, I ruined the party again. And Dr. Sip talks about sexy, sexy turkey necrophilia. You're welcome. On with the show. Hi, I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath. Melissa is this amazing dog trainer, podcaster, and author in Somerville, Massachusetts. I train humans so their dogs are happy and well-behaved. And I'm Sip Sipperstein. Sip is a dragon veterinarian in Oakland, California. Yep, I'm a doctor for bearded dragons and bunnies and birds and other critters. And you've just landed in Totally Possum. An animal podcast for adults. Each episode, Sip and I will use our combined expertise to share amazing animal stories, give you an inside peek into our professions, go deep-ish into animals in the news, and maybe even reveal some tips that you will be glad to know if you have pets at home. A stew of the practical and the just plain silly. It's a Zootopia party, and we're determined to have some fun. We are not going to watch our language. We're letting our hair down. You just don't know what we might say, so cover your children's ears. You've been warned. Unless your kids are cool with massive piles of kinky cicada sex, magical raccoon dog testicles, and occasional swearing. It's your call, folks. We're going to start with some reviews and like just trying to catch everybody up. We did get some really cool fan art, or at least some some interesting interpretations of fan art. <laughs> so why don't you talk about that for a sec? We're going to give it two more weeks to receive fan art, and then we will give away our t-shirt prize of a Totally Possum Pod t-shirt, women's small or medium <laughs> only. <laughs> and it is entirely possible that a gentleman in Scotland is going to win with his fan art poem, which I thought was a great interpretation of fan art. It hadn't occurred to me. I was picturing visual. But Gerald in Edinburgh has a good chance of winning a t-shirt. We'll see. You cannot restrict art. Art is no. in the eye of the beholder. And this is artistic. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got two more weeks to send us your interpretive fan art of something you heard on the podcast and or an idea for the podcast that we end up using. Send that to totallypossumpod at gmail.com. That's P-A-W-S-O-M-E. Correct. And... Uh, the other part of it was that we could also accept like iTunes rating reviews. I want to hear the reviews. I know. I'm so excited. They're five stars. Y'all are awesome. Thank you so much. Snort, hmm. so funny. This podcast is like hanging out with your friends when the kids are asleep in bed, talking trash, pandas. <laughs> <laughs> talking trash, dot, 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 pandas. Talking trash, pandas. We we have... We happen to know who XM Vo is because she sent us the sexy cicada. Kinky, yeah, the sexy cicada in the leather boot. That was <laughs> amazing. Yeah, fan art. So we have her to thank for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> so we can put those in with all of our fan art submissions and we will go ahead and we will select a winner and we will announce that winner in our next episode, which is conveniently in two weeks. <laughs> That's right, baby. So today we're going to talk about the COVID-19 dogs. Ooh. Yeah, I'm really excited. News is that the COVID dogs are ready to be deployed, which is very exciting. But what does that mean? Because deployed has a very specific connotation, right? It means like I'm being deployed to... Afghanistan, right? Like, so deploying just feels very heavy. But what these dogs are doing is actually really, really cool. Um, so let's first talk about what the COVID or who the COVID dogs are and what they're trained to do. So my my understanding of these COVID dogs are the dogs that are trained to sniff out 
people who have COVID-19 infection. So to be specific, the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 version of the coronavirus that, oh, I don't know, we've been dealing with for the last year and a half. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> Melissa, while okay. you were in your closet okay. recording your other podcast, Bewilder Piece. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I understood, and this is from information I had from very early on in COVID, was that they had trained some of these dogs to sniff inactivated version of the virus, is my memory, so that it was in a form that wouldn't be able to infect the dogs should the dogs and we didn't know yet should the dogs be able to get infected with SARS-CoV-2. So they had inactivated the virus and the Mm -hmm. dogs could sniff it out of something and then give a cue that this one was positive, this one's negative. That's as far as my research went because then I didn't follow the story after that. (laughs) Well, I'm here to tell you. (laughs) Sure, let me do all the hard work. So these COVID dogs, you might hear about them in the news and like on TikTok or whatever, but these dogs are trained to sniff out, as you were saying, Sip, samples of saliva and urine for COVID. Um, At least that's what they were initially trained to find. They were trying to see if they could find that same COVID odor on like sweaty gym clothes or clothing worn by infected people who were sweating. Mm. And then having those dogs moving from a lab environment, a laboratory environment, to say like an airport <laughs> a lab environment is a room full of tennis balls <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the labs in a minute <laughs> um, but they will walk and be able to find the infected clothing or the clothing that has been confirmed to be worn by a person with SARS-CoV-2 and they can find them in less than 12 seconds the slowest find was 23 seconds. And this was, my understanding, a puppy who was just learning how to detect oh my God. this particular odor. And if you've ever watched a puppy, it sometimes takes them a minute to, like, get their motion going. And then when they stop, just plain inertia, like, <laughs> takes over and they flip. <laughs> Slams so, them into a tree or a wall. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, like, it, it took him a minute, but he got there. But this was back in April, and now we're in July. So in three months... They have been able to train these dogs to find sweat and then put those dogs in public and train them and get them out, which is Mm. phenomenal. If you know about, um, if you've ever seen uh, canine good citizen testing, that's what we do at our dog training club. We will have dogs in there for over a year learning just how to sit and let somebody come over and say hi to them. Not Mm -hmm. necessarily like, right? And that's, (laughs) that's a very different skill sort of Mm -hmm. the cue is new person approaching my action is sit i Mm. smell covid i sit so it's a very similar thing and the fact that they got these dogs to be able to offer what is called active alert and passive alert active alert is let's say dog finds narcotics in a car and that dog is trained to dig and bite and just be like, it's here and be bark. very clear. <laughs> it's the bark narc. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that should be the dog's t-shirt. Bark narc. But then there's the passive alert, which is a sit. Um, usually a sit. Sometimes it's a down. Cadaver dogs will often lay down at the sight um, mm. of an mm-hmm. odor. Mm-hmm. But for passive alert, which is what you want in um in non attack type dogs is hey i found this thing and i'm just sitting for no reason by this luggage or by this person over here mr <laughs> tsa wink agent. wink nudge nudge uh-huh. wag 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 <laughs> <laughs> these dogs are going into places like airports and helsinki was one of the first if not the first where dogs could walk around and just do a quick screen with their noses. And they were 94% accurate, even with people who were asymptomatic. So they were That's picking up incredible. on COVID. Isn't it cool? Amazing. So this is a much faster way to screen a super large population. So say like a football game or or school. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. 
Yeah. Using these dogs, it's much less waste because you're testing the people that the dogs are alerting to instead of every single person. It's incredibly fast and it's 94% accurate, which <laughs> way more accurate than most pregnancy <laughs> tests I've taken, it turns out. Um, they are super cute. Oh, my. <laughs> I... <laughs> um, you can use them in schools and airports and festivals and all of these really cool things. And this came on my radar because Massachusetts dogs were deployed. At least that was like this headline in a news article I was reading. Um, and the first yeah. dogs of the country were deployed here to Massachusetts to a police department. And of course, because Massachusetts, one is named Hunter, not Hunter. <laughs> Hunter, H U N. Of course. T A T A. <laughs> Thank you, Massachusetts accent. Hunter and Duke. Hunter. Duke. Duke. <laughs> They're not booing. They're just saying Duke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. I know. It's so good. So I imagine, though, one of the reasons these dogs are as quick to learn compared to maybe someone's random pet is that they've been personality screened for this. Like they've been pre-screened yes. that they have the right disposition to and motivation to learn this stuff really quickly. And the cool thing is with dogs, um, nose work is a sport that I actually teach or scent work. Sorry, nose right. work is trademarked. So I am not a certified nose work instructor, but I am a scent work teacher. So I can use the word scent work whenever I want because <laughs> oh, okay. that is not proprietary. But dogs are hardwired to find things with their noses. So in cases I, I give this presentation or I gave this presentation at the Museum of Science just before COVID lockdowns, I got to talk to kids about how dogs would be able to find things like malaria on socks worn by kids that were tested mm prior to wearing the socks and the dogs mm -hmm. had actually hit on pairs of socks that were not at the time tied to kids that had malaria because they tested right. negative but the dogs were right they went back and tested those kids and found out that the kids actually had malaria so the dog's noses were picking up <laughs> picking right. up what the virus was laying down <laughs> like, i recall a story from some years ago where they were trying to train dogs to pick up melanoma mm -hmm. and they had their confirmed cases and then they had their control subjects mm -hmm. and they had them all lined up and the dogs are you know doing what you said the passive responsive like sitting in front of the people who had the melanoma yeah and this dog kept sitting in front of one of their control subjects oh, and they shit. were like oh my god the dog's just not getting it the dog's not getting it and Always it turned trust out the one dog. of their control subjects <laughs> had melanoma and it's a good thing the dog told them because they yeah. caught a lot earlier obviously than they would have which yeah. is amazing so these dogs because they see with their their noses they're basically like x-ray vision they can see through walls they can see 40 right. feet under your feet 40 <laughs> oh, feet right. underground that's four basketball nets top to bottom uh stacked on top of each other underground they can sniff and be accurate if you train them correctly they need to use them for your for the pregnancy test they do <laughs> out of the thing at the at the drugstore first response and you like take home a puppy <laughs> good news honey it's negative but you know like i should get a second one to test so i'm not pregnant i'm just making sure so where I'm going with that is that with these dogs, you have so many that can be selected for this. And it doesn't have to be a breed type or a breed specific type of dog to do this work. So right. as a result, mm -hmm. they can have mixed breed dogs. There, um, there were spaniels and labs and, and all sorts of dogs being used in the first six dogs. I think they were out of Finland. And here we're using prim primarily Labradors just because we can get them really easy. They're dogs that were either bred for uh, seeing eye work and are no longer able to do that work, um, dogs mm. in shelters, um, you could probably get a bunch of pities to do it. But I think part of it is trying to select for dogs that are friendly. You can train them very quickly um, and making sure that the people who are going to be in airports are going to not be turned off by the dog. And, and the idea of a big happy lab is easier for the general public to accept more so than say a a blockier headed dog mm -hmm. or a or a Rottweiler or Doberman who are just as easy 
adequately trained to do this work. Bloodhounds as well. But they're just so big. And if you're going through airports with little kids, picking a dog that looks like, oh, that's a happy dog. And people can see, oh, look at that big lug. <laughs> look at that big lug. Right. Oh, Hunter, Where the association the in the in the popular the culture is, is uh, friendly and approachable. Right. So going back to this idea of dogs going into spaces, it's important to know that while I... Melissa, and probably you too, Sip, although I don't want to speak for you, I'm going to. We speak are excited. for me, baby. <laughs> we are thrilled and super excited that these dogs are being, quote, deployed into public spaces right. to help people. So while I'm not going to lie, right, and, and I think I can speak for us both saying, hey, we love these dogs. It's going to be awesome. And I yeah. personally would feel much better, especially since vaccines for kids are not going to be available by September, October as initially mm-hmm. planned. And we are in the most densely populated city in all of New England. I would feel much better sending my kid to school if COVID dogs were used in schools. But I'm also super aware that not every child, every adult, every population, every culture is comfortable around dogs. Right. And right. There are plenty of cultures where it's just not the same association with a cuddly dog or a dog wouldn't be a, a creature you allowed into your home or they just right. seem threatening, period. Right. Or if you're a kid that's been chased down the street by a dog or if you pass a really mean dog barking out the window every day and that's your only mm-hmm. connection to dogs, that can be incredibly scary and, and traumatizing. And so my my biggest issue with Hunter and Duke, even though they are themselves very good boys. Who's a good boy? Mm, very Who good found boy. the COVID? So, so good. Oh. I found the COVID. I found the COVID. I'm a good boy. <laughs> but I'm a white woman who grew up as, in a family with a working dog sledding team. My dad right? worked in a police department. He was friends with the canine officer, right? Right. Um, and... I understand fully that these dogs are fast and great and effective and that those words, great, fast and effective, are the very same words that are used when dogs are used as weapons against people, too. Mm, Right. And while I would love nothing more than to go back into schools with kids and do what I love to do, right? Show Mm -hmm. kids what dogs can do and how to say hi and how to ignore working dogs, and most importantly, how to say, no, I do not want this interaction. Yeah. And and, and I think that's important for kids to recognize that in dogs, too, because there are too many times where adults are like, oh, no, say hi to him. He's friendly. He's friendly. He's friendly. And the kid is usually the first one to pick up. No, he doesn't look happy. Right? Mm. Um, So a dog being cute is not permission to say hi. And a kid who can't advocate for themselves, it's not permission to be re-traumatized if you've had a bad experience with dogs, even if it's a working dog, they're trying to help them. So it's a matter of not making assumptions about how people are going to respond to having a dog in their environment. Yes. And it becomes particularly important and prescient in this present time, 2021, having dogs being deployed to a police department and going into Mm -hmm. schools and in our schools like we're getting police out of our schools Mm. because kids aren't feeling safe with them there and parents don't feel safe Mm. with them there uh, Mm. certain populations of people do not feel safe with officers in their schools i'm a white person i'm like hey you know if i get a parking ticket or a a speeding ticket i'm probably going to get let off That's Mm. not the case for Mm -hmm. many of the people in my community. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. if every kid, if if these COVID dogs were brought into schools, I would hope truly that as these dogs are being, quote, deployed, that they are not being handled necessarily by police officers, that they are being handled by people, maybe even like me, people who know how to handle dogs in public spaces without being threatening. Mm-hmm. people who are looking for the comfort of the dog to say, hey, this dog actually doesn't look like he's comfortable right now. Let's get him out and bring in a different dog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe search and rescue handlers who are really good at doing that kind of work, mm-hmm. giving them a COVID dog. And I yeah. and I just hope that there's some attention being paid as this program continues, that kids can say no 
and that maybe police should give these COVID dogs to different handlers. I will never forget. There was this police handler. I think I told I told you this story before. Um, and this do- this guy had like a hyped up shepherd in the airport. And mm-hmm. I was coming with mm-hmm. Ace and Brian to come visit you long time mm. ago. <laughs> Remember mm-hmm. airplanes? Remember airports? <laughs> <laughs> this officer had this hyped up shepherd in this airport and these terrified kids. Um, there were like three of them. Two of them had to have been under the age of five. And this mm. mom was holding an infant in a carrier on her chest. And the mm-hmm. dad had all of their luggage. And it looked like it mm-hmm. was a huge trip they were going on. And they walked through and the officer is screaming, walk by the dog, walk by the dog. Don't pay attention to the dog. Walk by the dog. And he's like, ma'am, get your kids. And he's screaming at her. And so God. you've got an entire airport of people watching this go down. Everyone, No one says anything, including me, and I'm really ashamed that I didn't record it or that I didn't say anything. They eventually got through. But what that does is that reinforces their fear of dogs. Right. That whatever trauma there was or fear they had was amplified and reinforced. For right. me, as you know, white kid's daughter of a cop with my daughter who's just like, oh, that's a working dog. And we walk through. We just don't look at yeah. the dog. We just keep walking. It's not a big deal for us. It's it's really upsetting. And it, and it makes me so sad to see that. And that's why I think having people like me being able to go in and talk to people about consent, even with in the context of dogs uh, with like little kids, you can say yes to this. You can say no. When they bring these dogs into public places, having people being able to say, no, I would rather take the alternative. I will actually just volunteer a test. I do not feel safe walking by this dog or I don't like right. dogs or I was traumatized by dogs or I don't. They don't even have to justify. You could say you can walk by this dog or you can just get a COVID test. And if it was really just that easy, the people who want to walk by the dog can. And the people who mm-hmm. are just like, I can't, can just mm-hmm. go get a COVID test. And it's yes. really not that hard. It's just not cool to use these dogs in this way sometimes and making Mm -hmm. sure that everyone feels that they really are safe. Because these dogs here to make us safe, right? But we have to understand what safe means to everyone. And just bringing a dog into a school as much as I would feel safer does not is not a shared Mm -hmm. uh, concept for everyone. You know, I'm sure there were reasons why this was directed through a police department rather than through some other agency. But it is interesting to me that this isn't a program designed around public health workers. You know what right. I mean? Like, you know, having a public health worker who maybe just doesn't look as, I don't know, um, mili- military and, yeah. you know, doesn't have to have the the uniform that everyone recognizes, police officers, and, and really focusing on um, the optics of it yeah. in order to make having these dogs do their work obviously be less threatening but be more appealing yeah more you know softer around the edges um and and that the person who's working the dog looks like someone looks like a helper (laughs) you know what going back to what we were saying as to why they're picking the dogs they are because there's such a selection of dogs that they can use and why they're using labs and spaniels because of the PR of it, really, right. it's a marketing mm-hmm. technique for using these particular dogs instead of other dogs who would be just as effective or in some mm-hmm. cases, maybe even more so. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. it's the public Im- impression. And I really feel that giving some of these dogs to police right now is is not adhering to the same PR and the same marketing. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a mixed bag. It, it's a mixed bag. and And that's not to say that I'm anti-police or that we on the show are anti-police it's not at oh, all clearly. that mm-hmm. maybe they should hand the leash off <laughs> to somebody yeah. else <laughs> like, right right i'm and i'm guessing like if you're listening to this podcast you probably feel like yay these dogs and and i would you know that that's not to take away that feeling it's really just more to be more aware as to how we can use these dogs responsibly i think that's really the crux of it right Cool. <laughs> woof. Woof, woof. Shut up, Hunter. Shut up, Duke. Mm-hmm. 
Melissa, as someone who was is was a horse person, and I believe went to a like a horse college. I went to a pony school. Uh, it's a pony, a, school. <laughs> pony school. That's the joke. It's um, it was a liberal arts college that had an equestrian major in Ohio, in Northeast Ohio, in a little town called Painesville. And there are Ooh. lots of stories there. But yeah, I went to an equestrian <laughs> school. I started okay. to teach. Everything yeah. had to do with riding it. It's a thing. So anyway. <laughs> As someone who went to an equestrian school, you'll be familiar with some of the material I'm going to present at the top here. When people are trying to breed horses, because the actual act of mating can be um, hmm, dangerous. A little bit. For the horses in particular, well, both of the male and the female. But there is kicking involved, and that could be anything from him, like, scratching up her back or uh, and not her in a good kicking way. him in the... Not in a good not way. Not in a good way. Her kicking him in the face or in the nuts. So... <laughs> Often people breeding horses will use other techniques. And one system is to use something called an artificial vagina. And in my research, I found two, one called the Missouri AV and the other one, the Colorado AV, AV standing for artificial vagina. Not audiovisual club. (laughs) Not the audiovisual club. Do not go and get the film projector. (laughs) So these are like very large insulated sleeves that fit well over the horse equipment when he's ready to go and (laughs) giddy up (laughs) giddy up and what that does is it allows the semen to stay at the right temperature until they can collect it in the sleeve and then that gets put in little vials and frozen tubes i forget i learned it all in vet school and now i've forgotten the details but (laughs) point is that they protect the female by using this contraption and they'll also use the this thing that is um very much like a pummel horse from gymnastics <laughs> so <But> not except, <laughs> except that it's sort of right pimped out with springs and things so the male will have the the sensation of having mounted the female and then the sleeve is used to collect the semen and they use what a, a teaser mare, right? They uh, Melissa? do. I. That's a real thing. It, a teaser mare. It is, and we. Hey, had, big boy. You, hey, big boy. <laughs> she bats her like long ashes, lashes. We had one of these uh, mare. Well, we had this breeding program at this college, the horsey school I went to, and it had um, mm-hmm. one stallion. His name was Absolute. So all of his offspr- offspring, because you know the early 2000s were absolute vodka, absolute orange, absolute shit show. And so, like, <laughs> um, but the mayor, uh, they would wait till the lady horse was in heat and use her odor as a tease to bring him in and he would mount the ho- the pommel horse. And the, the freshman who drew the short straw would have to help collect this semen in what I had always imagined until... Just now, a two liter <laughs> bottle of Coke. <laughs> <laughs> but there was this one episode where, like, Absolute broke out of his fence and he goes tearing in, wild eyed and horny as fuck. Um, and and the to the teaser mare's door, and he bashes open the uh, gate to her stall. And everyone's trying to stay calm by not staying calm at all. They're trying to get the barn manager. (laughs) Nobody can go near this horse. He was essentially a wild stallion. And he knocks over this door and he looks and there's this other female just kind of standing there looking at him, chewing like, yes, you rang. And he's like, well, wait, where the fuck is the sawhorse? Like, this is all wrong. Like, he was so confused. And in that confusion, they were able to get him and bring him back out (laughs) where's my inanimate girlfriend he's like this is i mean it's nice to meet you uh this is this isn't right like he (laughs) had had such um a positive association with the sawhorse (laughs) that he didn't know what to do with the real mayor standing in front of him that he had kicked the door down for can you imagine somebody like just i'm 
here and horny and you're not a blow up doll. Like <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I was just gonna say you're not an inflatable doll. <laughs> My point in all this is that animals don't always need the female of the species to decide that's good enough. Right? Oh. So yeah, so as it happens, slight left turn. <laughs> It was discovered a long time ago that turkeys in turkey farms weren't terribly discriminating. They pretty much would give a go at just about any side or part of the female, front, back, side, (laughs) didn't matter. The people who worked in these turkey farms discovered that, oh, their hand was good enough for the turkey. Oh my god, a they, farmer they named just... Cool Hands Luke has a whole no, no. different. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So in the 1960s, a Dr. Martin Shine and a Dr. Edward Hale, and I really wanted it to be Martin Sheen, but I think it's Martin Shine. He could have gotten an Oscar as Cool Hand Luke in the Turkey Farm oh, no. Chronicle. <laughs> They actually did some research at the Pennsylvania State University to see what would be enough for these male turkeys to be interested in engaging in sex. Like, Mm -hmm. sort of, what's their baseline minimum? (laughs) And so they took a turkey carcass, and the boys thought that was plenty. So turkeys dig necrophilia. Got it. Yeah. So then they started to disassemble the turkey carcass. They started with the feet and legs. Whatever. Still good. They took off the wings. Still totally acceptable to the male turkeys. Oh, no. Melissa, they got down to a head on a stick. (laughs) And Tommy the turkey. Like a stick horse, but like a turkey head on it? (laughs) Having your kid ride around on it? Yeah, oh God. <laughs> Tommy the turkey thought the head on a stick was totally sufficient and Jesus. would attempt to mate with it. <laughs> and what they determined, what they believed was that basically what the turkey was seeing when they were mating the female was pretty much just the back of the head and the neck. And that's why that was good enough like puritans looking at ankles it just got too much <laughs> <laughs> too much just cover up too that much neck head. Uh, so and you can see a, a lovely black and white photo of a male turkey staring at they had a neck of a turkey on a stick are you in, gonna have me put in the this link on that social? we will post oh god we will put this on our twitter god. uh so yeah They did go on to do another study, effects of the morphologic variations of chicken models on the sexual response of cocks, (laughs) so to speak. (laughs) As it rolled on. Oh, no. Oh, God. It's still funny. Okay. We're good. (laughs) Carry on. That the chickens apparently preferred to actually uh, have hen bodies, um, attached to the heads and therefore describe the roosters as more discriminating. Oh my God. Um, so turkeys are sick fucks. Oh yeah. God. Like literally. Oh God. Literally. So while this just may seem like kinky research, in the end, the intention was to understand turkey breeding better because with farms that were having trouble with breeding their turkeys, they could look at what the issues were and adapt their setup or arrangement or maybe the breeds they were working with to have better success with their <laughs> with their breeding but honestly i feel like this research stands on its own i think it does or, or, or i guess if the chicken turkey has no legs it doesn't stand <laughs> <laughs> this is really horrible i'm a vegetarian oh god and this is, I, I i'm not advocating dismembering turkeys but but um, it is interesting to know that there are certain animals that are not um, as picky about what it'll take. Can you to imagine? Get taking... it on. <laughs> God, turkeys, man. That's messed up. A little turkey sex factoid for you and our listeners, Melissa. Thank you for that. <laughs> 
We're at the end of the podcast. Holy turkey necks, where does the time go? Our music is by Jason Shaw with additional music by Ableton Live. This week, our thanks go out to Deadline, the CDC, BBC.com, NationalGeographic.com, Nature.com, and The Hill, and the Bristol County PD Twitter account. Melissa did a lot of research this week. Mm-hmm. And IFL Science, Atlas Obscura, and University of Wisconsin. You can find more on our show notes or visit the website, totallypossumpod.com. And check out our Twitter, at PossumPod. And now, all that's left is shameless self-promotion. And I'm shameless. I'm a certified professional dog trainer outside of Boston, Massachusetts, the author of Considerations for the City Dog, host of Bewilderbeast, another podcast for curious folks, but unlike this one, it's totally safe for kids and work and everyone. You can find more about me at melissamcumacraft.com. Take it, Zip. I'm a veterinarian who loves to work with exotic pets in and around Oakland, California, the operator of Zuzu's Puddles Productions, and when I'm not treating hedgehogs, Russian tortoises, and Amazon parrots, you can find me bundling up for another summer in the Bay Area. <laughs> you can find more about me and about exotic pet care at drsipvet.com. That's D-R-S-I-P-V-E-T dot com. You can reach us both at totallypossumpod at gmail.com and send us your topic ideas, questions, bizarre and silly animal stories that might be on the wild side, and fan art, please. It doesn't have to be R-rated, but it helps. So that's it. That's the end of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Hug your pets if you've got them. Unless you have a horny turkey, in which case I professionally advise against it, because, you know, state laws. And to respect those opossums, or as we say, stay possum. Stay possum. Or <laughs> you